All right, we are in the book of Genesis, and I think that I could actually, you know, I know I've been saying that for a while, get out of 17. Um, so let's go to Genesis 17, verse 21. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were uh, bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. And Abraham was 90, uh, was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. All right, so prior to this, the Lord has given um, some of the, and, and will yet give uh, some explanations of, of the covenant that he made or, or the agreement he made with Abraham over Ishmael. But um, uh, let me just read this. I mean, I, I, would, I really would like to move on to chapter 18 if we could. Um, and uh, so let's, let's see if we can do that. Let's see if I can do that. The covenant promises are of land and seed and blessing, but the blessing is to the firstborn. That's the covenant God made with Abraham concerning his firstborn. <clears throat> the heir will come through Sarah, but Sarah is 90 years old. Because of this, we say that he will come forth through supernatural means, but the important point is, is that he will only come forth through God's means only through God's means. Again, we get all caught up in the, the miraculous of it when it's just his seed is coming forth and don't focus on a miracle, focus on the seed coming forth finally. Um, Abraham's 99 years old and God says to him, in the next year, it's going to happen. She's going to get pregnant. Or... And uh, Sarah's 90. <clears throat> Um, so uh, uh, he will only come forth through God's means which are outside our realm or abilities outside of our realm or abilities and she would bring forth not by God's intervening to fix her not by a miracle but by the living seed coming forth but God's promise here to Sarah was not immediate. Timing is involved for a reason, and, you know, timing is almost always a factor. I mean, it's just so, so big. Uh, God waits until it is clearly impossible for them or us to conceive on their own. He waits till it's basically impossible before he starts moving. And with all those years and all those different possible firstborns that Abram was bringing up, it, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen. God has to deal a death blow to our abilities. And so um, uh, it is almost, uh, let's say, God waits until it is clearly impossible for them or us to conceive on their own. Why? Because they must be convinced. They must be convinced that they cannot, cannot do it. Okay. We think we're convinced all the time, and yet we do more stuff to bring about what the, only the Lord wants to bring about and to bring about the seed, which there's no way that we can bring about the seed. Only the Father only a father 
can bring forth seed in that sense. So, um, so because they must be convinced that they cannot do it. So, God probably really enjoyed and appreciated that they laughed. Did you ever think of it like that? That they laughed. Remember, Abraham laughed this, this trip, and Sarah will laugh later on over the same thing. And uh, what, what if the Lord wasn't offended with their laughter? In fact, he enjoyed it so much he named their, son, their seed laughter. Laugh. He laughed. And uh, because he knew that they wouldn't be laughing unless it, in their minds, is completely impossible. <laughs> and he's going, all right, we're getting into a good place now. Uh, it proved that the timing was soon to come that he could now move. All flesh must be out of the picture. And it's interesting because we read, and I'm sure it'll have some more, a little bit more here about the circumcision, but it, it, it's interesting that at the same time that all this is happening, he is, he is declaring um, that you must be circumcised. The flesh must be cut off. He's declaring that, and, um, and he's declaring it right now only at this time where they're too old, so you must be circumcised even if you're 99 years old, meaning it's never too late to get rid of the flesh. Never too late to get rid of the flesh. Um, all flesh, flesh must be out of the picture. It calls for faith. It calls for faith in God to bring this about and, and not faith in miracles. You can say, well, I have faith in a miracle working God. That's still, in a sense, missing the point. He, do, do you really believe that the big point of waiting this much time was so that God could show everybody that he does miracles? And we go, I serve a miracle working God. Or do you think he waited this much time for the Father Himself to bring forth the seed He wanted because only He knows. Only He understands that seed. Only He knows the life that He is after and that He cares about and that He longs for. And so, you know, He said, be circumcised and I'm, gonna, and I'm not even going to bring up circumcision until it's, you're, it's impossible for you. So, um, uh, it calls for faith in God to bring this about, not faith in miracles. So Isaac would be born a year from the time of his, of his announcement. Okay, so uh, it says, he, the Lord says, but my covenant, but my covenant, all these things that he gave to Ishmael, only because, only because Abraham begged God, really, he begged God that he would be the firstborn. God didn't answer that prayer. But God just ended up doing all these extra blessings of the flesh just because he loves Abraham. And Abraham, you know, was wanting all that. Um... In verse 21, God says that he will establish his covenant with Isaac. Oh, get ready. He'll establish his covenant with Isaac, not with Sarah. Not with Sarah. He said she would bear in her flesh and in her body and bring that forth. But she's not what it's all about. 
we have this treasure in just simply earthen vessels. It's, it's, not, about, it's not about us. Um, she shall bear the heir, but just because you bear it doesn't mean it's about you. It is the same with being a branch of the true vine. We bear the fruit, but the vine produces it. Uh, proof of that? Well, cut a, cut a branch out of a vine before it's brought forth through fruit and throw it out there and see how well it does. Um, now, it appears that if you use that analogy, then uh, it wouldn't work on this front, but it does work on this front. You, even though you're cut off from the vine and therefore cut off from, so we go cut off from the vine. Oh, I'm going to be a branch that's burned up. That's all we can think about. That's all I've ever heard. The emphasis that, oh no, what about me if I'm cut off from the vine? I'm going to be burned off. There's, there's no grieving for the sun. There's no grieving that I, I didn't bring forth the, the life and the seed. I didn't bear it. It wasn't mine to do, but it was, I didn't bear it. And, you know, so, you know, you're not cut off from being able to um, go out and start your own ministry or, or, you know, do all kind of stuff that's not the Lord, that is from that nature, that is, um, that, that brings forth Ishmael's, that God said, this shall not be the heir. Y'all remember that one? God was, he, he was not going to be moved. He was not going to be moved. He was adamant about that. Stand for his son, not this. And then that happened a little while back. And then Abraham comes along and says, Oh, that the thing that you have rejected all along would be the thing that you accept. Um, so the, the life, the, the fruit, the seed, it comes forth out of us. But what comes forth is not us. It's him. See, I mean, there's a whole lot of people. There's a whole lot of Christians that are looking forward to standing before the Lord one day and being able to say, you know, um, uh, you know, I want to tell you, Jesus, why? Here's here's the here's the thought processes and the the view that they have of what this thing's all about. Um, I. I will tell you all the things that make me worthy to go to heaven. See, even that thought has no thought of, well, you know, of the sun, of the seed coming forth. Just, just tell God your Ishmael things and oh, that God will hear all your Ishmael things and go, oh, that's really good. That's good. That's just what I wasn't looking for. You know, um, <clears throat> so uh, verse 23 says, And Abraham took Ishmael his son and all that were born in his house and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. And Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day, Abraham circumcised, uh, was circumcised and Ishmael, his son. So from verse 23 through 26, we see that Abraham wants to carry out his side of the covenant agreement. By, remember, walk thou before me and, you know, uh, by circumcising everybody that the Lord said. So he was circumcised at 99 years old. And that tells us something. And Ishmael was circumcised. Ishmael was circumcised. And he was circumcised at 13. It mentions both those. Um... 
But what we see, what we see from these verses we're reading to end out 17 and the next chapter and the way that Abraham is, it's like that circumcision did him a lot of good. A lot of good. What about Ishmael? Circumcised also. Just like every every true, you know, if you will, born again person. No, it didn't turn. It got it actually just got worse. It got worse from that point on. Um because um, Ishmael being circumcised can be in the mind of Ishmael that I'm everything God wants. That I'm, this is, I mean, Abraham got it. You know. Um, so this means that God accepts me but there's, there's too much, too much coming that's going to just show, you know, you might have been born first, but you're not first born. You might have been first in birth order, but you are a far, far cry from God getting why you existed on this earth. I'm talking to Ishmael. I'm not talking, well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Um, but it is. Far cry. Um, so I wrote down, uh, it's never too late for the application of the cross. 99 years old. It's never too late for the application of the cross. See? Okay. Well, I'm 71, and uh, I live at a time in an age in an age of you know, in an age 71 years old that is more susceptible to a pa worldwide pandemic. So you just never know. I mean, you never know. You know, uh, somebody would say. Well, you know, is that sad for you? No, it's not sad for me. You know, I am. Uh, I will not try to move the hand of God or act like I am the hand of God by going out and getting the virus and going home, if you will. I mean, in truth, I mean, this is not somebody else's teaching. In truth, I can't get any more at home than I am with the Father the Son, the Holy Spirit, at least in this realm that I can imagine. So I'm, you know, whether by life or by death, you know, however the Lord wants to do stuff. But I'm not, I'm not worried and I'm not going to go do something stupid. And I'm, but I'm also not going to, in my heart and mind, self-protect. I'm going to be the lamb whenever I feel that the Spirit of God is calling for that. Never too late for the cross here. He's, he's uh, 99 years old. Um, where was that? Abraham was 99 years. Okay, yes. And it's never too late. All must be circumcised and bear this in their body. Bear this in their body. Not bear this in your theology. I mean, only. I mean, yes, there is that. There is that. And not theology, but bear, bear the understanding of it, which leads to a, a, a being that is like a circumcised being, not just one who was circumcised as a token of what that would mean. <clears throat> um, so there's there is that, but but many would want to make that everything. 
And while it is important, it is not more important than the thing that it is trying to lead to as far as what is in God's heart. And I think I even said something like that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, all must be circumcised and bear this in their body. Abraham sees the desire of God's heart to focus on one image. That image involves circumcision. So he, he learned something that day. He learned something that day. He learned, hmm, you know, before it was altars and something else died or something else was cut or something else was, you know, that sort of thing. See, I, I mean, I believe that that's the beauty of the faith of Abraham that is offered to us down at the end, in other words, in Galatians and all these places, is that he, Abraham noticed little things that we miss. He noticed things about God. God would bring up stuff and he noticed and God brings up circumcision. He goes, hmm, this seems like a shift. You know, God's all of a sudden shows up and says, walk before me and everything before that was just have faith. And now it's walk before me. And now he brings up circumcision, which also relates to me. And But it doesn't just relate to me. It relates to, you know, almost like a sacrifice or whatever. It, it, it is cutting the covenant. I won't go into all of that. but um, So, Ishmael was 13 when circumcised, but never lived according to its meaning. So is it? Is it? Is it possible? Is it possible? To, you know, have that laid forth, that circumcision of the heart laid forth, and yet it never lays hold of us? Um, Ishmael was 13 when circumcised, but never lived according to its meaning, its meaning. What did he thought? What did he think it meant? I don't know. That's you know. That's not for me to know. I don't even care. But it makes me ask the question: What was he thinking? What was he thinking? <clears throat> this is important to remember. Ishmael may be one of Abraham's sons. But he was not considered his firstborn son by God. Okay. Abraham even thought him like that as the firstborn son. Well, can Ishmael walk before you? You know, could you just, you know, get, get used to him? But he, you know, and you see God's response here, and you saw it back over there about, you know, Eliezer, this shall not be. And um, you, you realize that it was possible on the earth, if you could stand over there and watch, and if I was Abraham, and to watch, and God standing right there, and, I, and I'm going... Uh, you know, it's it's impossible. Me and Sarah have been trying for a long time, and now we got too old to it. We're out of the game. Just just accept Ishmael. And you're watching that, and you're going, you know, I think I I think I know what God's response is going to be. And God says, you know. Uh, Ishmael may be one of your sons, Abraham, but he's not one of mine. He may be looked at as your firstborn, but he's not mine. He wasn't, he never has been, and he never, ever, 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 ever will be. It's out of the question with God. Well, maybe I can convince him if I say, oh, that, you know, you hear that language. It doesn't say, well, how about Ishmael? No, no. Oh, oh, that Ishmael could, you know, be the one. All right, I'll bless Ishmael. 
Because you want him blessed, and of course those blessings are going to come out to bite you in the butt, but that's, uh, that's okay, I'll give you what you want. Um, but he is not my son, you know, he is not, he will not be my firstborn. So we'll look at that a little more closely in a couple of chapters down. We'll actually get into it. The flesh brought forth that son, and none of the promises apply there to the flesh. The trouble with Ishmael is not God's fault or handiwork. The trouble with Ishmael and the trouble that he's going to bring, and of all of that, is not God's fault, and it's not God's handiwork. You know, um... Did Abraham know what he would bring upon his seed for generations and generations? Well, probably not. Because we can't think that far ahead. We're going right here. I'm right here. And this, I got this right here, so. God's going. You know, you kind of want, like Jesus said to the disciples, you know not what you ask. Um, the trouble with Ishmael is not God's fault or handiwork, but it is your soul that brought this on your family forever. In the prodigal son story, the elder son was the father's firstborn, but was not God's firstborn. And Ishmael may be Abraham's firstborn son by birth order, but is not Sarah's firstborn. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> that Ishmael's not Sarah's firstborn. Isaac is Sarah's firstborn. And, but he is not Sarah's firstborn, and he does not have the spirit of God's firstborn son either. That's, that'd be the lamb. That'd be Jesus. Doesn't have that. He, he never had that. I mean, um, throughout the story and what's brought up in the New Testament are only basically testimonies of that he wasn't it and he didn't have that, you know. Uh, in fact, he is so far from what God would call a firstborn that in Genesis 22, okay, so in fact, Ishmael is so far Notice the word so far. So far from what God wanted that, I lost my place here. The Lord refers to Isaac in Genesis 22 not only as Abraham's firstborn son. God refers to Isaac as his firstborn, but as his only begotten son, as if Ishmael was never born. Where, how long do we think that's going to go? We think we're going to get up there before God, and I'm just using everybody's colloquial thinking on that, and, and we're going to present Ishmael, and it's going to end, it's ended, it's, it's not going anywhere. Especially with God. With God. Um, um, but as his only begotten son, meaning that in his eyes, Abraham has no other son. Okay. What if when he looks at you, he says, you only have one son. You have no other son to offer me. Meaning, you're not it either. I mean, especially if you're presenting yourself as Ishmael. He's going, I only have one son. Period. It's the way I think. That's the way I am. I'm a father. I have one son. I'm the father of that son. I'm not the father of your Ishmael. You're the father of your Ishmael. But I have a son. 
and I want that son. So, this is how it is with the father. In his eyes, he has only one son, but he put that one son in every believer so that he may manifest in our mortal flesh. Praise God. Okay, so, that's the end of 17. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a whole section. Not really. I'm just messing with you guys. <laughs> um, uh, in, in Genesis 18, uh, first of all, I mean, it really starts off with a bang if you really understand it. But, you know, a bang in, when it's me has to bang several, several classes or whatever. But there is this part in chapter 18 that is close to the front that is so incredibly beautiful because it finally declares the true nature and I'm using a specific name when I refer. The true nature of Elohim. It finally just makes it so, so, so clear. So, um, I, I am excited. I'm excited for what the Lord wants to say to our hearts, not what Randy says in classes. I mean that. It's not about what I say in classes. It's about what God says to your hearts that matters. And I believe that we gather together because we are hungry for Jesus. And we gather together because our, we, we, are, we are laying down our time and, and, and all the other stuff that, it, that we had to lay down in terms of equipment or whatever else to be with Him. And to be together with him. So I think on Wednesday nights that's going to um, felic fel felicitate <laughs> means make it happy uh, the uh, uh, the sharing and the give and take and the opening up of the word by you as the different ones of you share and we all get to you know, taste of what the Lord has been sharing with you. So, so please come prepared. If necessary, wear a uh, Tuesday t-shirt, or Wednesday t-shirt, sorry, Wednesday t-shirt. And um, let's enjoy the Lord. Let's pray. Father, you are above you are above all things, and what's above all things in your heart is not you. You are above all things, but what's above in your heart is not you, it's your Son. It pleased you that He would be the firstborn in whom all would dwell. You say that, Colossians, and you call him the firstborn, and you, you describe him in that manner. There are no Ishmaels. There are no Eliezer's. There are no the, the rest of our choices, like Lot and all, all the others that we would have. There is the one that you exalted above every name. And, Father, it's, it's just kind of funny to me that you say that in Philippians, that you've exalted him, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Lord, may our hearts bow. May our hearts bow bow easily without being pushed down, without 
expectations of kneeling. May we bow, not just kneel, bow deeply the way Abraham does and will yet. Oh, oh, the difference of our bows. <laughs> oh, gosh. Father, the extreme difference between Abraham's bow in chapter 17 at the beginning and his bow at the beginning of chapter 18. Oh, 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 Father, let the Holy Spirit breathe life in the scriptures and make it the living word burning in our heart. Burning, did in our hearts burn? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.